Hello, everyone. Ooh. Hello, Nightworms. Um, I have some very special guests with me today, and I'm so excited. Um, Beverly Lee, she's to my right here um, in my screen. Um, we have been friends forever. I was telling someone, I think that Bev is my first bookstagram friend. I think you are my oh. first Instagram friend <laughs> ever. Um, so we've met uh, a long, long time ago. Um, just sharing things on bookstagram and our love of books and then both of our careers have just sort of evolved from there and it has been exciting to see a relationship develop between her and Nicole hello Nicole hello <laughs> and Nicole tell Nightworms a little bit about yourself um, and then how you met Beverly well, um, I primarily write vampire fiction, so I have two previous books, um, Beguiled by Night and Citizens of Shadow, and Beverly and I, um, the way we met was we read our, each other's book series, well, mine wasn't a series at the time, but um, we read them at the same time and we just sort of struck up a conversation on Instagram. I mean, I think so many good book friendships have been forged on Instagram. Yeah. But um, we ended up on a different Nightworms interview together. And we realized that after we completed the interview, we were talking about it, our books together some more. And we thought, I think Beverly was the one that came up with the question, actually. She was like, oh, my fault. if our vampires met each other. Oh, well, well, yeah, yeah. And so the result of that was this tiny little novelette called Crimson is the Night. It's very small, but it's just like one night where the vampires meet each other. And um, we kind of couldn't stop thinking about the story from there. Um, we went on to write other books. But that story was always kind of percolating in the background. Yes, a seed. A seed that, would you say, sort of germinated as a result of Beverly's series uh, with uh, the G Gabriel Davenport series, right? Is that So that's where the origin story begins, right? Yeah. With yeah. Your, so Beverly, tell us about the trilogy. Okay, so the trilogy is made up of The Making of Gabriel Davenport, A Shining in the Shadows, and The Purity of Crimson. And basically, it follows Gabriel's journey from back when he was a baby, what happened to him as a baby, his life throughout his childhood, until he was um, age 15, he was living in a place called the Manor, which was a home for gifted supernatural children. Um, and then the entity that had plagued him as a baby came back to claim him. Um, enter the vampires, enter Clove, the master vampire, and the two uh, young fledglings, Moth and Teal, that were under his care. And that's how the story spiral. Then it continues through A Shining in the Shadows where the boys meet. It's so hard not to do it without spoilers. Um, I know. <laughs> the, the boys find themselves having to fend for themselves while Clove deals with an old adversary. And then that carries on into the purity of Crimson where, again, the boys find themselves hunted um, and it all comes to... A very big climactic end uh, and that was the end of purity yeah so i just have to say i've read the trilogy um and it started with the making of gabriel davenport and when beverly first said that she was writing it um i was like oh that's so cool you know I'd, i would love to read it and i really didn't have any expectations you know um and so i get a copy of the book and i was to be honest, like my mouth kind of was like, oh, like, I think your prose and your storytelling voice, Beverly, is so immersive. Um, so much. Like, really dark and gothic and atmospheric and moody. 
Um, and so I think early on when I started, you know, reading more of the books and getting more involved in the story, I thought, I think Beverly Lee has replaced Anne Rice for me. <laughs> like, that, that was, I remember you saying that, and that was like <laughs> the, the most incredible compliment. I still get chills when I think about that. Yeah, I mean, it really is true because there's so much of, you know, Anne Rice definitely was the beginning for me with the interview mm -hmm. of a vampire. And I, you know, loved it and everything, but I felt like the gothic and more, uh, I guess it is just the gothic flavor that you add to it um, because Anne Rice's storytelling voice leans more into a contemporary um, vibe, whereas yours is very much more um, gothic. And so I think that just appealed to me more. Um, and Nicole, like what, when you first read Beverly's series, were you in, had you had already started Beguiled by Night or were you in, were you inspired by it? No, I had finished um, Beguiled. It was already published when I read Gabriel. And, okay. you know, um, I think the, f I mean, we can talk more about how these series have combined into a multiverse because that's kind of a separate story. But yeah, the thing is, we both have that adoration and influence of Anne Rice. I mean, she was obviously a huge huge influence on both of us and so we we frequently say that we feel like we're carrying on her tradition of writing and and storytelling and so the thing is I don't think this would have worked at all if we didn't have that foundation mm -hmm. in because our vampires like they have a lot of differences but they're they're more like kind of superficial differences at the core their similarities are so close that it made it possible for them to come together. Mm -hmm. um, if key factors were not in place, it, it just wouldn't have worked. We would have had to, um, you know, finagle things with the story, yeah. and maybe get into uncanny land a little bit. And I think another reason that our books work well together is that even though there are supernatural elements like time travel in mine and demons and, witches and other supernatural entities in the Gabriel Davenport series is that they're still kind of very much rooted in reality, mm -hmm. even those sort of supernatural elements on top, but that's at the base, it's reality, like it's a real world or an alternate kind of experience, you know. Yeah, that's what I think I am the most curious about. Um, you know, we had talked earlier and we're exchanging information back and forth in emails. And you said that 95% of this book was written in real time. Um, and that is not something I've never heard of before. So I've talking, I've talking, I've talked to a lot of authors before who have done collaborative work. And I'm just so curious as to how you a decided to do it that way and b how it like worked you know how so just talk about that for a moment this writing style well I, well, well i think when we'd written the little novelette crimson is the night because it is a novelette and just ten thousand words we'd done it the normal way as in i'd written a bit and i'd hand it over to nicole and then she'd write a bit but that was just 10,000 words. And when we started writing uh, Conclave, um, I penned the first chapter. And I think halfway through the second chapter, when our vampires had to meet, it was just a bit weird for me to write my bit and then hand it back over to Nicole to write a few sentences and then come back to me. It was going to be too confusing. It was going to take oh, wow. too long. So we decided that we were going to write it live in Google Docs. Oh, I see. So you guys both had a document open. Yeah. And then Bev, you would write and then Nicole, you would write and then you guys would just go back and forth like that. Yeah, it, it, it's the rawest way of writing. It, it's so vulnerable. You have to have incredible trust in your writing partner to do that because they see all your spelling mistakes. They see you change your mind and go back and change a word and carry on. But it is just, when it clicks, it is just the most amazing experience. 
it was all like it, it just felt like call and response it was like like at times it was it, it was like reading instead of writing which is wild i don't know if that's yeah that makes any sense at all it but does. like you know wh whichever one of us was not actively writing or sitting there going <laughs> you know it's like reacting and it it was such an amazing way to write that we had time to make like instant character reactions right which was incredible because you know um maybe something that you thought your character was going to do or say is affected by what the other writer is putting on the page in real time and you have to quickly maybe react it's almost like a real life situation at that point it's, it's crazy yeah. Well, it makes sense to develop a story that way because so often I hear authors talk about how the characters are sort of like a life of their own and have existed on the page for a long time. So they have a very strong presence. Yeah. And so it would be difficult to wait a long expanded amount of time to go back and forth um, without being in real time because you know, they're sort of commanding their own journey. Yeah. And so you guys can just kind of relate as your characters are are doing that in real time. So, I mean, it makes perfect sense. Plus, Beverly, you mentioned the trust aspect, but you guys have developed a strong friendship. I mean, you guys went to and met up in Paris, I think. We did. Tell me a little bit about that. Oh, gosh. I can't, I can't remember when we actually decided to do that. It was after we'd written the whole trilogy, because Conclave at the moment is a trilogy, and we'd written it all, and we decided that it would be amazing if we could meet up. And Nicole has always, always wanted to travel to Europe, always wanted to travel to France. So why don't you take it from here and tell everybody about your love for French people and French culture? <laughs> um, that's a whole other topic. But we, we just thought it would be wonderful to take the book to Paris. Um, and also, we so we... the the journey was two weeks and we did a week in England and then a week in Paris. And so wow. it was very significant because of the aspects of our story being British vampires meeting French vampires. And so it was sort of symbolic to break it up that way. And we just, we took a copy of Conclave with us and we just, we carried it everywhere with us. And, you know, we took pictures of it in places and it was just like, it, it felt like we were taking it on holiday with us, you know? Like, yes, I love it. I we love also, it. We wanted to do our cover reveal from there because it, again, it just felt very symbolic and significant to, yes. to make it happen there because the entire book takes place in Paris, so. I mean, you guys just have gone all the way. Like, that's what it reads to me is this just – everything is entirely intentional and purposeful and in speaking to you guys have a really strong mission for the book too. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, you know, the representation and the audience that you have in mind, like, can you talk about um, basically who you wrote this for? Gosh, right. Okay. So, <laughs> We, we had a very hard time actually working out who this book actually was for um, because it is it is a dark vampire romance, but it's unlike any dark vampire romances we've ever read before. Um, but it but but it is horror. It is quiet horror because there's not a lot of on page kind of gore or anything but obviously they're vampire they they do kill so it is there and the scenes that have that are very visceral but it's also about uh, like the horror of grief um and the horror of making yourself vulnerable the horror of finding something and not being able to have it um the horror of the vampire existence so that's why we kind of like to lean into that when we say it is horror, but it's possibly not the kind of horror that the normal Nightworms audience would expect. Right. Right. I mean, I think that definitely puts it in the same camp as like Anne Rice's books, which are not necessarily like full of 
violence or, um, you know, body horror or anything like that. But we're we're not shy about talking about blood. That's definitely a, a huge presence in the books. Yeah, and I will say too that fans of Anne Rice will enjoy the opulence and you know the seduction that is present in Conclave, um, which mirrors you know, a lot of the vibes that you find in Anne Rice books about vampires. Um, but also, like, I think it's just more gay. <laughs> than, I mean, Anne Rice goes there, but she doesn't entirely go there all the time. Um, so talk about, there later. Talk yeah, about we did. vampires yeah. are all gay. <laughs> I mean, why not? I mean, you know? Why, why go, you know, to, through eternity just picking at one plate when you can have the whole thing, the whole banquet? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I know. I love that. I someone I don't remember if it was you, Beverly, or Nicole, but you posted like a an enamel pin that said mm. vampires are. Is it vampires are all gay? Yeah, um, yeah. <laughs> yes, it's so true. Um, yeah, there's another one that says there's no such thing as a heterosexual vampire. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, those are the kinds of vampires I enjoy reading about. I don't know about anybody else, but. Um, if they're going to sparkle, let them sparkle. Um, <laughs> <and> then, <laughs> um, I also think when I was reading through it, I felt like TikTok needs to grab a hold of this book because the whole spice factor is really popular on TikTok right now. Um, you know, there's whole spicy book clubs. I mean, I was at a birthday party a few weeks ago for a coworker of my husband's and I met one of his coworkers' wives for the first time. And my husband said, oh, she owns a horror subscription company, blah, blah, blah. And I go, well, what kind of books do you read? And she said, well, I don't really talk about it. And I was like, oh, are they, are they bad? And she's like, well, there you probably have not ever heard of it, but they're kind of spicy is what they call it. And I was like, oh, I've totally heard of yeah. spicy books. Get out of here. <laughs> uh, so then we spent like a whole time talking about it. But um, was that a really important element for you to include in Conclave? Well, when, when we set out to write it, we didn't have any, we didn't have any plans for it because when we first started to write it, it, it wasn't going to be published. It was just going to be a fun little vehicle for Nicole and I just to get our vampires together again. It, it was super fun. Like we, we didn't, we honestly did not set out to write this for publication. It was like writers can have fun yeah. without like monetizing what they do. You know, yeah. I mean, it was one of those things and we just did it like kind of as a reward after we finished Citizens and the sum of your flesh we're like let's have some fun and you know just write something and <clears throat> so that's how it started it ended up like this this is the official edition <gasps> that's the omnibus of the three of them that's enormous yes it's, it's, it's like it's like a weapon yes it's huge we we wanted to have like a because you know we wrote it online obviously we wanted to have like a physical representation of what we did you know, and there it is. But don't don't panic, people. It's not like that. It's it's actually like this. this is book <laughs> yeah, one. that's the first one. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but yeah. So because we started off without the intention of publishing it, we just kind of took the bridles off. You know, yeah. Yeah. there wasn't any like writing for market or being concerned that you know we're writing something that maybe we shouldn't be writing <laughs> but yeah. also because we're not plotters we are character driven and we just we're discovery writers so we don't plan any of this so we didn't set off to write a spicy book at all it just mm -hmm. happened because we let the characters just go do what they wanted to do because the yeah. characters are spicy yeah they they were definitely into it yeah. <laughs> so this is what we want to do. <laughs> yeah, it's good. Oh, ooh, okay. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah, but, I love that. Yeah, so it wasn't I mean, like we purposefully right. wrote a super spicy book, 
that was but it will appeal to those fans it's, yes well because as it turns out there's a lot of spice in this book a lot that's good to know i mean honestly i think like there used to be sort of a stigma around it people would like my co my husband's co-worker's wife would just sort of be like oh we're in this like spicy book club but we don't talk about it to other yeah. people it's just sort of this fight club yeah exactly. <laughs> it's something we do on the side it's not something we advertise to people but i think people are way more open about it now i think you know tiktok has really pulled the covers off and revealed like this is what we like this is what we're doing and we're not ashamed of it we're proud of it this is what we enjoy like you know so I think like it's the perfect time to sort of take a deep dive into something that traditionally, like you said, markets were shy of before. Yeah. And, and I mean, the thing is, it's this book still, it, it doesn't read any differently than our previous work. It's no. the same voice. It's the same writing style. It's just, you know, unhinged. <laughs> it's unrestrained yeah. unrestrained that's a very good yeah. word yeah, yeah which is great because well both of you are um or have been Beverly I know you were picked up um by a, a publisher is that correct at some point um I'm I'm yes the Gabriel was um picked up by a Spanish publisher um and translated um, but the other two are still just in English. Okay. So you, you have been in charge of your own work and publishing your own work. Um, and is, do you foresee trying to, you know, get into the traditional market or is publishing these works on your terms with your covers and your, you know, preferences and everything? Is that, is that what you want to stay doing? Both of you. I think with Conclave, we are too attached to it to ever give it a cost to anybody else because we'd be awful to deal with. We'd be like, no, no, you can't, no, you can't do that. No, no. Yeah. And then they would just lock us out, basically. Yeah. And no one would want to deal with us no. in terms of this book at all. We are nightmares, yeah. We are nightmares. <laughs> I mean, well, doesn't that make sense, though? I mean, you guys get to control the publish date. You get to control where and when you release a cover reveal. You tell me about this cover too, by the way. Like it seems like, you know, you were all the way in, in, in every way in control of the artistic design of this cover. And then I'm sure the other two books are going to tie into it. So talk about the process for the artwork for this. Well, you can take this one, Nicole, because that's kind of your side of it. <clears throat> well, um, we we had a lot of trouble landing on a cover for this book because we weren't really sure how we wanted to communicate that and also mm -hmm. to do something that represented both of the series in a way or, or married them visually. And um, so our, our first foray into the, the cover design did not work out at all. And we had to completely regroup and come up with a new concept. And so we had, I'll, I'll show the cover here, um, glare a little bit. So we had a photo shoot and it was done locally here where I live in Rancho Mirage, California. And we um, conveniently had the photographer had sons that were the age of the boys in the book and so they became boys from the crypt and were our vampire hand models but we <laughs> we had a photo shoot we shot all three covers on the same day and beverly was there via skype on an ipad and <laughs> so she got to be there to see it all and it was absolutely incredible so i mean we have had our fingerprint on every aspect of this book mm -hmm every single aspect, you know? And so in that, in that respect, it is a true indie force, you know? And it, it, the same goes with the photographers. They're freelance solo photographers, professional videographers as well. But so it, it's an 
absolute total indie venture all around, you know? Yeah, I love that because in this day and age, it's so important to know where the art is coming from because yeah. there's just questionable things going on all the time. You know, a book will come out, everybody will take a look at it and be like, that's AI, you know, yeah. like that was AI generated. Um, and also now, you know, we're going to be wondering about where the stories are coming from. Like, did somebody just put this in, you know, in an AI feed and, you know, it spat out this story and now we're just, you know, the art. The art is a reflection of the artist. And I think that's what people are really hungry for is just truth and sincerity and a genuine <clears throat> product of the the authors. And it sounds like just as I'm listening to you guys talk, you you both are so like respectful of each other's space too. And like being there and being a part of every part of the process. Like it's just really um. I don't know. It's just really respectable, you know, to see two artists coming together in a collaborative way, but also just honoring each other, like just inviting Beverly to be there by Skype for this photo shoot. Like, what was that like being in another country and watching this photo shoot take place in real time? It was amazing. But the, the thing was, because of the time difference, because we're, I'm in the UK and we're, we're eight hours apart, yeah. when, when Nicole had this shoot, kind of uh, set up I was like sat there in bed it was 11 o'clock at night sat there in my pajamas <laughs> but it was it was it was incredible to see it kind of just take place because Nicole kept moving the iPad so I, I could see like what the boys were doing with their hands I could see the props that they use and the boys were just amazing because they had an iPad as well and we kind of had kind of photos that we'd seen for them to kind of work work with and they were just absolute troopers weren't they oh they were amazing they just they wanted it to be so perfect and they were so excited that they were going to be part of a book yeah. you know yeah. i mean it was an incredible experience you know it, it just it felt a little different than buying like a stock photo or yeah. something like that you know it was like we it the way this book came to life in the first place and then watching the visuals come to life in person it it was yeah. absolutely magical you know just yeah it's a true partnership um you know and your voices are are speaking almost as like one storytelling voice but there's you you're both represented in there because you're controlling each individual character as your own is that correct like yeah, yeah i mean cloves roll you know and nicole you would write your characters and not touch clove right well <laughs> <laughs> there was the odd time where it kind of bled into into one another and it would be a case of um i think the first instance when i was writing a scene where the boys all go hunting together um, and Nicole's character, Eric, was all part of it. And it just got, I, I couldn't type quickly enough, it, it just got so kind of intense. And I, I, said, I said to Nicole, I don't know why I'm writing Eric, but I am, so just go with it. Yeah. And yeah, you, yeah. You, you've written um, a couple of mine as well, haven't you? Just in that kind of heat of the moment exchange. Yes, yes. I, I mean, when she was writing that part with Eric that she was just describing, I was just sitting back going. <laughs> Eating popcorn. Yes. I mean, it was incredible. It was absolutely yeah. incredible. And, you know, since we obviously, like, we wrote that, the original three books in three months, by the way. Wow. Um, but 300, 320,000 words, three months of the day. Wow. That yeah, is really brick impressive. That I showed you the brick. Three months. Three so, months. However, we've spent like a year and a half editing it. Okay. You yeah. know, Makes because sense. that uh, that amount of words in three months is not going to be perfect, right? So, right. Um, we've spent much longer editing and finessing it than we spent writing it in the first place, but. 
there were so many instances while we were going through it where we kind of couldn't tell who wrote what and there are just certain sections where it it really does feel like what you're just describing like this union of voices you know and it does it does go so much deeper than that with our friendship like we have a shared email address we have multiple like shared accounts and we don't make decisions without consulting each other you know it's very much like an equity here and that goes straight back to the the trust that we have in writing each other i mean especially if if you're as an author if you're very attached to a certain character the thought of like handing that character over to someone else and going here write them is that's horror yeah you know yeah. It's, it's i don't know for us that's very very difficult to even think about doing but not with each other we'll do it yeah. in a heartbeat and i think we know our characters so deeply at this point that we could easily do that and maybe no one would know the difference yeah. I mean, on a small level, not creatively, but on a small level, I totally understand this process because Ashley and I have owned Nightworms together for, you know, five years and we have a shared email account and we have shared social media spaces and we talk for each other all the time. So whether we're addressing customers or whether, you know, we're writing bookstagram posts in our Nightworms account, she is me and I am her and yeah. we are the we, you know, so we collectively speak for each other and have that trust where over the years we've just learned, you know, each other's what, oh, Sadie would never really say that or I should ask her about this first. Like there are times where I text her and go, oh, are we doing this? <laughs> like, do we do this? Do we say this? Like, is this something we do? Um, you know, so we'll check with each other on that. So I completely understand the level of trust the intimate relationship you two must have in order to you know put something like this out there um i mean like even just speaking of which like do you have an idea about when like so conclave just came out do you have a schedule of how these are going to roll out in the future kind of <laughs> <laughs> yeah. because all, all, all three were written at the same time um and books two and three have had like two rounds of edits, two rounds of edits, I think. So they need another round of edits and then they get the very nitpicky edit where we basically go, should this be an M dash or a semicolon? Yeah. <laughs> that yeah. kind of an edit. Um, but we're kind of hoping that book two may be out at the end of September, but then I think a lot depends on how well book one does and how long we think it might take us to get book two to an actual published level because we're very nitpicky, very nitpicky. Yeah, and you, I mean, you were writing your own books too, am I right? Like this is a shared effort, but are you also writing singular? Yeah, I mean, I, I'm, I'm going over the concept for... Um, a new story at the moment uh, I just have notes but it's there in the back of my mind kind of going it's my turn now yeah um, and Nicole is writing Nicole yeah it's um I'm, I'm not sure if I should talk about it yet because it feels very filmy but I uh <laughs> this project has consumed me like so much that like I've hardly even read anything else lately because it's like, uh, you know how actors sometimes talk about like um, just being consumed by a role so much that like they don't yes. get out of character when they're not on set. Yes. It's like kind of feels that way because it just, my head is so full of this book and I can't really do anything else, you know, which is, a little concerning sometimes, but <laughs> <laughs> I should, I should do some your own work. <laughs> yeah, but yeah, I mean, it's you know, also it's just it's so much work getting a book like this out, and um, I have spent so much time with mechanicals and 
formatting and laying this out because I did all that. And it's it's a lot of work. Yeah. A lot of work. So it doesn't leave a lot of time for writing, especially because I work full time as well. So um, but yeah, for the foreseeable future, I'm just consumed with conclave. But well, so um you are you the Nicole? Are you the one that does all the graphics too for yeah. promotion? Oh uh, yeah, because your promotional graphics are always really great. Um, I don't know if that's part of what you do for a living, but I mean, it seems like <laughs> really professional and <laughs> like they're always really good. So, thank you so much. I'm I'm a professional graphic designer. Oh, so that, <laughs> yeah, that makes very, sense. very handy. It's yeah, that's very very handy. handy. Saves us a lot of money. <laughs> yes, exactly. Um. You know, since Nightworms are are the intended audience for watching this video, they probably should know where they can find you on social media as well. And then what would be the best way for them to support your book? Like, where do you want people to grab this book? Well, um, we have a, a joint account, like we mentioned, um, on Instagram, called, and it's at Nicoverly, the combination of our names. Um, we also have individual accounts. Um, maybe the easiest thing to remember and to access us would be to go to thevampire.org slash conclave. Yeah, I'll put all these links. In and the we've got links to purchase the book there. Um, yeah. we, have, we also have links in our bio on, on our solo account. Um, mm -hmm. I'm under the constant voice um, and Nicole is under big out by night um we have beacons list there where if people just click on that it takes them to all kinds of links of where to purchase books where to where to see our things where to see the conclave playlist because we have a spotify playlist as well yeah oh did you write with music or or is this just inspired by i'm the one that has to have perfect quiet when writing but nicole does like to write with music but this I was kind of like out music like we're, we have so many things in common it's kind of scary but that's one of the differences that we have yeah. um i and like Ka I can't write and kale them. that's a difference as well yeah i really like kale but <laughs> i hate i hate kale <laughs> It's all okay. our decoration. That's that's all. It's it's only purpose. Yeah. It uh, so <clears throat> really just a sidetrack for a second. Um, I'm on a plant based diet currently, and so I do have a lot of smoothies and eat a lot of vegetables. And you can the nutritional value of spinach and kale is really comparable. And if you put kale in a smoothie, you can taste it. It's like lawn clippings in your smoothie. <laughs> But if you put spinach in there, it disappears. So I would much rather have <laughs> something that disappears versus, you know, a smoothie with my backyard. <laughs> you see, you see this, 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 is, this, this is where vampires win out because they have one food source. Yeah. You know, and that's it. <laughs> I love that vampirism is so popular right now. I think that there is a lot of vampire novels coming out on the market, whether they be translated from other countries or whether women are writing them or men are writing them. Um, you know, there's lots of, you know, um, representation of people of color. <clears throat> I just read for the first time the Gilda stories, and I was wondering if uh. either of you have read that. No, we haven't, but we were on a panel, weren't we? Yeah, we were on a panel um, with Jewel Gomez, and we both really wanted to read that. She's yeah. fascinating. She was wonderful to listen to on this panel. Yes, the reason why I asked that, too, and I think this would really um, resonate with Nightworms readers, is because the Gilda story sort of reminds me of Conclave in the sense that there's, you know, queer relationships, obviously, but... I also think think that Jewel Gomez like prioritized relationships um, in the the vampire universe versus the kills um, and the brutality and you know just emphasizing and focusing on um, you know the food source for vampires and Gil the Gilda stories talks about like an eternal relationship with people and with humanity and with this idea that you're going to live forever. 
and having like a relationship to the universe and all of this side stories of things besides just blood sucking. And so it did remind me of the way that you prioritized relationships Mm -hmm. and, you know, toxicity in relationships and, you know, these sort of like feuds and long time, you know, problems that they have that aren't just where do we get our next kill? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So. Yeah. I think that's definitely valid with all of these books, the, even the preceding ones, because, because again, we like write character driven fiction. Like sometimes it's, it's more about the development of those relationships and the communication that they have with each other or lack thereof. And so it's more about that than, than what happens or plot. It's, I mean, not that there isn't a plot, but it's just, that's not the emphasis. And, um, you know, again, I think people that read quiet horror, they kind of have that sense of dread, which is still there without on page, you know, violence or acts. But we also don't believe in completely removing that from the equation with vampires because they are predators, they are killers and it happens and that needs to be there. Otherwise they're just kind of like weird, like people that stay up all night. Yeah, (laughs) Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Or yeah, it's just kind of dancing around the topic but not really getting to the topic. Yeah, no, it's, it's a complicated life, those vampires. You know, they have a lot of feelings about having to rely on human beings for their food source <laughs> it's very complicated yeah and that's that's something that both of our worlds share is that we emphasize that amp- uh, vampires are amplified versions of their human selves so whatever emotions or characteristics were present in their human life that gets you know exponentially amplified as a vampire so yeah Well, we do have about like three minutes. So I did want to give you the opportunity if, you know, I like to ask authors this question a lot. If you have your ideal audience right in front of you and they haven't read the book that we're talking about, what would you tell them and how would you pitch this book to them? Why should they read it? Why? So (laughs) I'll go first. Um, (laughs) If you like vampires and if you like love stories and if you like queer representation and lush gothic settings and vampires that don't always make the right decisions but have to live by the consequences of their actions, then I believe Conclave will be the book for you. Wow. (laughs) I was like, check. (laughs) <laughs> Nicole what do you have anything you want to add to that oh gosh I I think that pretty much covers it but um you know we we've been trying to find comps for this and it's it's a little challenging because we can't really find anything that is like an exact match but we've kind of linked it more to like films so I would say for a film comp like if you liked only lovers left alive or crimson peak or like marry those two with the television show Versailles. You know, I mean, there's um, there's a lot going on here, but I think, again, really fans of Anne Rice are gonna be like people that would enjoy all of our work. You know? Yeah, and I've been reading because I'm, well, I'm writing a, a, a book that centers on women, um, women in, that write horror. So I was actually compiling a list of like some sapphic vampire uh, romance novels and, you know, that could just scoop right up into the same. I mean, like House, so if you like House of Hunger um, by Alexis Henderson, even though she really kind of wrote around the topic of vampirism, um, but still like the toxicity in relationships and the different, you know, um competitiveness between uh well they're not vampires so we want you know the supernaturalness of that uh universe um but also just the gilda stories like i mentioned 
um, A Long Time Dead, which has like a sophic romance in it, but also like deals with a vampirism in like the eternal sense. So, I mean, those are good book comps, I think, for Conclave, even though Conclave does lean much, much more into, um, you know, the spice, but also like they have a whole history. So it just feels more epic um, when Clove and Teal and Moth and Gabriel have like such a long standing history and relationship. So if you like the epicness of a long term series that goes from like here to here and you can enjoy like this universe. I would recommend that to readers who like to dive into an entire universe. Yeah, great. And we also want to emphasize that this is like like an MLM story. So these are all like male vampire characters yes. dealing with here. Um, and so we, we have been saying that this book can be read as a standalone or the series without reading the previous works. And some of our early readers like completely did that with no problem, but then they had to go and read the earlier ones because they're like I want to yeah know. I mean for great. sure yes for yeah. sure so you don't feel like you have cool. to read 5.25 books before you start this one um right. hopefully you'll want to go back and read the early ones so so is do you recommend like going through Beverly series and then going through yours or staggering them or what do you recommend well, <clears throat> It's my, my, my series first, isn't it? In the, in the 5.25 that we have before we actually join the, our multiverse. So The Making of Gabriel Davenport, A Shining in the Shadows, The Purity of Crimson, Beguiled by Night, Crimson is the Night, Citizens of Shadow, Conclave of Crimson. Oh, lots, I'm going to put... Lots of C, lots yes, of C e words. Email me that entire list so that I can also put that in the show notes for okay. people. Yes, that would be helpful. Um, also, one of Beverly's characters makes an appearance in Citizens of Shadow, like a vampire that no one has seen before. And he's also in a conclave. So Wow, I love that. I love this like entire cherry universe. I, I think people love that. I mean, like fans of like Robin Hobb and stuff, they're full on. Like they know how to get into a long-term series, but it's cool that you could also read standalone too. Yeah. Well, great. Thank you so much for joining me, Beverly. I know it's- Thank so you. Fun. Gosh, it's gone really quickly. <laughs> Eight hours away. Um, but yeah, thank you so much for joining me and for talking about your book. I'm so excited to have Nightworms um, hear about it on the YouTube channel and that they should definitely check it out if they're into all of those things we talked about today. Thank you so much for having us, Sadie. Really, yeah, Thank you very much. Yes, of course. Um, okay, I'm going to end and you guys stay put though. <laughs>